Welcome everyone and thank you for attending one of the Siemens CNC Cinemark webinars. Today's webinar is going to be talking about variable programming and we're going to do that in both the shop mill environment which is our conversational programming environment um, but more, probably more in depth we're going to do that in the g-code side in the program guide area. So you're going to kind of get a chance to see how you can use and leverage this type of formatting and this type of programming in both methods. So no matter if you're a power user doing a lot of high-end G-code stuff, or even if you're a new user just kind of getting into the system and doing a lot of programming and conversational, you can still start to take advantage of some of the stuff we are going to discuss over the course of the next hour and a half or so. My name is Chris Pollack. For those of you that might not know me, I am a dealer support specialist for Siemens. I also host these webinar series. We try to put a webinar on approximately every six, six to seven weeks or so when we, when we can. Um, so hopefully you guys are enjoying them. I'm here as a contact, uh, certainly for all of you. If there's any questions moving forward, you can always reach out to me. Um, certainly you have both my phone and my email. Email is probably the best way to get a hold of me, but you can certainly always try to call me as well. So I always like to kind of give you guys a little bit of a teaser of what's coming up next. So uh, our next event, we're going to start to explore. And over the course of the next few, um, we're going to probably do a little more turning than we have in the past. And we're going to explore some of the advanced capabilities from the turning side. So our next one, we're going to specifically look at programming through shop turn, but a machine that has C axis and Y axis capabilities. After that, we're going to get back into some five axis content. And we're looking at programming a 3 plus 2 type of orientation, but through G-code with Program Guide and showing you a bunch of the cycles that supports that. Um, and then further from there, we are going to add even more advanced content from the turning perspective. I want to get into working with sub-spindles, maybe multi-channel machines. So keep an eye on what's coming up. We've got a lot of great content coming up over the course of the next few months. So um, if you guys should know already, but if not, CNC for You is our main website, main landing page. Um, this is where all our webinar data is hosted. So if you want to refer to any of the previous webinars that have been done, um, then what you're going to want to do, you're going to want to go to CNC for You. You can click on the webinar link and, and try it from there. I just had a quick question from one of our attendees that was having some audio issues. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, check out CNC for you. Uh, if you didn't happen to have it, you know, some of you guys get invited to these webinars because you're referred from other people. So CNC for you is our core landing page. Use this website uh, on the screen here. Um, you can get over to that, click on the webinar links. You can register for additional webinars. Um, and you can also view all the previous recordings of the webinars right here. As well on CNC for You, if you click on the training link and you go to our CNC Operation Program Training, you can see the classes we host out at our Chicago facility out in Elk Grove Village. So there's a list of classes here that you guys are absolutely welcome to attend. They are generally three-day workshops. There's no charge for attending workshops. We appreciate you guys spending the time and the money just to come out and work with us. Um, there's some great contact. We, we do some service-based training, and then we have three different level classes. Our first level, level one, starts with conversational programming, shop mill and shop turn. Level two gets into a little more advanced content with uh, G-code programming, um, up to four axis, and turn, goes, gets into some C-axis work from the G-code side. And then our level three is our full five-axis class. I personally host that myself. Um, so just go to this main site, you can drill into here, you can see the upcoming classes, click on registration, you'll get a registration window that will pop up, you can select the class you're interested in, register for it, and come on out and join us. I think it's well worth your time. Additionally here, um, I've been talking about this a lot lately because it's a new initiative we have currently going on, and this is a registration initiative. So if you register your CNC, you get some added benefits. Uh, one of the big things is you're going to get 70% off of CindyTrain. CindyTrain is the software where we use when we do a lot of these demonstration purposes and if you want to do any offline program. So it's all right here for you. Uh, take a look at it. Again, you can either use this 
uh, you know, just drive right to our main CCPU website, click on the registration link, it'll explain all about it. So today's webinar specifically is looking at the 828 and the 840 controls. Now, however, the base fundamentals of the 808, which is our low end control, works really the same way. So don't be surprised if the majority of content that we show you here today could actually even be applied on the 808. But specifically, all the screens you're going to see, everything that's going to be relative to 828 and 840. So the idea about this course and why I kind of put it together is I wanted to be able to start to explore and, and get you guys into thinking about the next level or the next stage of programming. You know, you start with conversational, maybe you get into G-code. And then you want to see, you know, where can I push it from there? What, do we, what can we do? So that's really where this whole variable-based programming comes into, into play. You may hear a lot of different manufacturers use different terminologies around this type of programming. Some people call it macro programming. Some people call it parametric programming. But at the end of the day, um, specifically, it's all kind of wrapped around the same concept. So that's what we're going to take a look at today. So we're going to break this down into four main sections. We're going to look at the initial section, which is working with R variables. Those are predefined variables in this system. And we're going to give you some simple examples of how I could apply R variables, how I could utilize them. From there, we're going to get into creating custom variables. Um, there's a bunch of different custom variables. We're going to specifically look at and go you examples of local variables, which we call LUDs and global variables, which is well GUDs. And you're going to get to see how to create these variable tables, start to apply these variable tables. Once, the, once we get through the LUDs and GUDs, then the utilizing system variables is going to be the next step. So that's where we're going to dig into variables that are pre-created for you that are in the system. You know, these are the variables that we use to make the control run and uh, do what it's doing. Looks like we're having a couple people with an audio issue. Let me just make sure my, my audio is okay. Yep, big test. Okay. So let me just, uh, for those of us that might be having a problem with the audio, I'll try logging back in. I can't quite tell you the, uh, the instruction because you can't hear me. And let me just, uh, all right, sorry about that, guys. It's always fun managing the uh, webinar as I'm presenting it. I'm trying to keep my eye out for any questions that come in if you guys are having problems, as well as presenting it for you guys. Okay, so so back to it. So we'll look at uh, utilizing system variables. Uh, so again, system variables are pre-created in the system, and there's all kinds of great information so we can start acquiring about the system, things that we may need to know um, about it. From there, our final section is going to be logic programming. So this is kind of where we start to wrap up everything. Um, so we're going to start to talk about creating conditionals, that kind of stuff, and building it from there. So our first section we're going to talk about is going to be um, specifically when we get into working with R variables. So that's going to be, I would say, your entry level in getting into this stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to start to kind of talk about these, these variables, what types of variables they are. Um, so in this system, you have really two types of pre-created variables. Uh, the first thing you're going to see are the type of variables you have from an R variable perspective is going to be on the left side of the table. So R variables are what we call channel specific variables. So that means if I had a machine that has, you know, like two turrets, it can run two programs simultaneously, we call them channels. The R variable is dependent to only one of those channels. So I can't pass information from one channel to the other. Um, it's kind of locked to that channel. And that's what an R variable is. Now in 4.7, we created standard global R variables those variables now transcend channels, so I can move data back and forth. That's what makes them a global variable as opposed to a local variable or a channel-specific variable. Now, in both cases, the number of variables 
is generally set by the builder. So when they initially commissioned the, um, the variables on the system, they decided how many they wanted to give to you. And the reason why they did that is really just memory management. You know, if they're not sure how many variables you're going to use, they may give you 100 or so. There are absolutely a lot, lot more variables available in the system. I think the last time I looked at the parameter, it's like 34,000 or something crazy. However, you know, if you start to assign memory to this area, you're going to take it from other areas. So your part program is going to go down. So it's a little bit of a balance. Um, the MDs that are setting the variables are here in the list. So if you ever wanted to see um, what they had it set to, I mean, certainly you can go to the table and just scroll, of course, or you could look at this machine data. I do warn you, don't change the MD. Refer to the OEM or refer to a proper procedure before you change this number. Um, this is what's called a memory reorder. And there is extra steps required when changing or recommissioning a machine that requires a memory reorder. Okay, so how do the R variables work? How can I start to use them? What is the whole deal about? So what we're going to do is we're going to show you a simple little example. We're going to write them locally in the R table. So I'm going to show you where the R table exists or we can use them by writing them local in the part program. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a basic G code or a basic shop mill program, shall I say, and we're going to apply some, some variables and see what it does and kind of fool around with it. So we're going to do this through Sinutrain. The end example is we're just basically machine a pocket, but what we want to do is machine a pocket, but change some of the characteristics of the pocket on the fly, as opposed to having it you know, rigid and having to go edit the pocket if we want to make any kind of change. So we'll transition over, and this will give you a start to see kind of how these variables can be applied. So what we're using is we're going to use Sinutrain. Sinutrain we typically use for these webinars, and it's an offline PC or uh, control emulator riding on my PC. You'll be amazed um, how much you can do inside of Sinutrain. I mean, there's very few things that I can't uh, duplicate or demonstrate here from an operation program standpoint. Um, that I would need to control for. I would say probably 99% of everything you would do from an operation programming perspective, you can do within Sinutrain. So where are the R variables? That would probably be the first question we'd have. Well, if you go to your offset table, you're going to find a button called user variables. Now, under user variables, all our variables are going to be found here. Specifically, however, the R variable table. So if I want to see the R variables, I have to click on it. If I wanted to play around with the global R variables, I can click on global and see those. Now, I happen to have mine already set up to display comments. And I had received a question a couple, um, I think it was my last webinar. Somebody was interested on, as to whether or not we can write to this new comment field uh, from a part program. Unfortunately, you can't. Uh, this is writing to just a back end file that's just storing all these comments. But what you can do is you can come in here and you can certainly write. So if I knew that, you know, this R1 was going to be my feed rate, I could type in feed rate into the field. So now when a user takes a look and they see it, they're going to kind of know what you were trying to use this variable for. Now, you do have to turn on the variable column. So that can be selected by expanding your vertical soft key over and pressing the display comments button or not. So if you have display comments off, then you're just going to see the variables. We toggle it. We're going to get the variables to come on. Okay. So here would be my first option as far as using variables or setting variables. Now, from a programming perspective, if I go into my program, I create. I just created a whole bunch of examples for this webinar because we have a lot to go through. As you can see, we actually have 13 examples I methodized. So our first example is using these R variables. Now, let's play around with it. I'm just going to comment out this line initially, pretend it doesn't exist. What is this program? It's a basic shop mill program. So you guys have seen me generate shop mill programs in the past. It's going to follow all the same rules. So here's my header page. Then I go into a given cycle. Maybe I want to do a pocket. So I open it up. Now, what can I do with an R variable? So basically, any place that I would have a numerical value input, I can substitute an R variable. And you're going to find that that rule is going to apply for potentially any of our cycles. There's very few areas that you can actually replace an R variable. So if you type a number in, so if I go to a field and I type in 
an R variable and hit, en hit enter or input, if it takes it, if it saves it, that R variable is there. Now, it's not case sensitive, so I could have left the lower case, I could use an uppercase, that's fine. So what we're doing is we're saying, hey, you know, I want to be able to adjust my feed rate without editing the program or adjust my spindle speed without editing the program. I want to maybe change the dimensions of the part, again, without having to go into this cycle. So what's going to happen when I go to run this part program, the system is going to automatically jump over and take a look at this page. So had I set my feed rate to 10, set my spindle speed to 1500, maybe, you know, maybe my length or my width, whatever I want, I think it's three and four. When we run it, those are the values it's going to use. So here I'm feeding it 10 inches a minute. We have a commanded RPM, 1500 RPM. Had I been paying attention to the width and the size of the pocket, it would have used those values. Now you are relying on somebody going to that table and setting them up properly. So the next step is, well, what if I don't want to, I still want to use our variables, well, what if I don't want to rely on somebody having to go to that page? So that's where you start to set them locally in a program. So the simplest way to do it in a conversational program is just create a G-code line. So you can create a G-code line at any point just by hitting the yellow input key. It's going to give you a blank line. From there, you can start to set the variable. So it's literally as simple as typing the variable number, so in this case R1, equal, and then a value. Now what's going to happen now is these values are now going to get passed and overwrite whatever's in that table. So this is what takes precedence. So if we run it, and we cycle start, now I see I'm running at 50 inches per minute, certainly want a lot quicker. More importantly, if I go to the offset table, we now see the overwritten R variables. Now that'll work for both feeds and speeds, as well as dimensional data. So if we were to simulate this part, we're going to come in, you're going to see some kind of pocket shape machined. So in this case, about six inches long, two inches wide. Had I just jumped over and made a quick change, we can dramatically change the resulting toolpath just by tweaking these R variables. Now, one thing to pay attention to, when you play around with R variables and you're doing that in sinew train, um, specifically, actually not in sinew train, specifically simulation mode, it used the R variables, but it hasn't actually wrote them to the table yet. So if you jump back thinking those values are here just because you simulated the part program, that's not actually what's happening. This way it doesn't overwrite something else that's happening maybe in the background, because you can do concurrent programming. So these values will only get written to the table when you run it in auto. Simulation will use them during the simulation process, assuming they were set here. If there's none set here, it then will refer to the offset table to grab them. Okay. So that's kind of step one. And that's how you can start to use your, your R variable. So, so begin to play around with it. You know, explore different can cycles, you know, where I can replace a variable for something else. The next step, however, is, well, what if we want to use them in G-code? We want to kind of do a little bit more with them, um, not have it just be a simple static number. So the next example here, not only are we going to use R variables in a G-code file, but we're going to start to do some basic mathematical formulas to them. So here I wanted the ability of, resizing a part, but a part that I programmed uh, more point to point. So what I used is what, what we call the, uh, the, the path milling functionality to program this part. So that's what we're going to take a look at here in a second. So we're going to go in and we're going to show you the structure of the program that I created. And, then, and I'm going to show you how I'm applying these R variables and a couple of tricks that I did. And you can see that we can then dramatically change multiple features within the part program um, as well as the, the result of the part program very quickly and easily. So this one I pre-created, and that is our example two, and this is a contour mill. So this is a G-code based program. And this is how I'm going to start to see variables be applied from a G-code side of the scenario. So here we have a basic safety start. When just using standard R variables, it doesn't really matter when where I set them as long as I have them set prior to the time I use them. And if I don't have anything here at all, then obviously it's going to use that, that table. If I put the R variable equals below the call, 
Well, it'll switch midstream, but it's going to use the default one that's sitting in the table prior to that. So just be careful. If you know that you want the R variable to be active the entire length of the program, I usually always put them right at the very beginning, whether it's right at the header or within the first couple lines, certainly before I do any motion command. This way I make sure um, that, we're, that we're good and that we have them. Okay, so what did I do here? Well, I'm setting up a couple variables, R10, R11, and R12. R10, based on my note, is going to control the length of my part in X. R11 is going to be the width of my part in Y. And then R12 is my corner radiuses. So how did I use them? Well, what I wanted to do is use our basic path mill cycle. Path mill handles over a regular millet. So normally when you do a path mill, you're used to going into the contour mill, going to create a contour, say new contour, give it some kind of name or number, and you draw the contour with our contour editor. Well, the contour editor is one of the few places, and this applies true to conversational as well as G-code, where if I try to use an R variable, it won't allow it. So you see how it just dumps in some kind of number relative to that R variable. So, you know, had I said R1, it's inputting just a basic number. So how did I get around it? I wanted to use the shape editor, but I can't use it for this contour editor. Well, there's more than one way to call up a shape and assign it to cycle 72 or our contour cycle or our path milling cycle. In fact, you have a bunch of ways. So the contour name is only one. And that's what you usually, usually use. But you can call up labels, and labels could be anywhere within the part program. And that's just a simple way to create points to jump to, call points. I could have called this up as an external subprogram. It could be labels within a subprogram. So the subprogram might have contained multiple contours. So what I used is I used the label command. I created two different labels. And then my labels are set down here below my N30. So a label is really any verbal term followed by a colon. So if you scroll down, you see I just encaptured, encapsulated all my instructions by two physical labels. So I called it label one, label two. It could be start one, end one. I mean, you can get as crazy if you want with a label. Just remember, you have to add the colon at the end of it for it to actually be viewed as a label. Inside the cycle call, you just type in the name of the label. You don't need the colon here. In fact, you don't want to put the colon here or that um, won't point to it properly. All right, so now inside my labels, I started assigning some R variables, but I said, well, let me do a little math. So in this case, I'm treating the middle of the part as zero, zero. So I'm saying, well, I'll take R10, which if I look up at the top, it's gonna to be at this point, a value of six, Oops, sorry, divide it by two. So now we pass back three and then assign it a negative value. So I'm saying, hey, find the upper left corner. And then I'm saying, let's find the Y position for the upper left-hand corner. So I'm taking R11 divided by two, but I'm keeping it plus because it's going to be on the top. Remember, zero, zero is the center of the part. And then I, really, I was just doing a box, something simple. So I walked around the shape. I used the round command to do some corner breaks. Now my chamfer command, you notice, I did not put a variable. So let's see what would happen as we run this program. So I come around and now machine a part that's six inches long by two inches wide. I get some kind of corner break and I get this big chamfer. Now, when you jump back and you make some simple changes, like maybe I only want it to be four, but I want it to be three inches wide and I want a half inch radius. Just by changing those couple simple numbers, I dramatically change the resulting tool path. My part shape is completely different. So for those of us to get into families of parts and their similarities, you can start to use this to dynamically change the program without having, having to rewrite the program all the time. Now, I also use the same variables in my workpiece blank. So that's why my stock is auto resizing because I use the variables. Now, maybe I wanted to say, well, not only do I want to set the stock to that variable with, but maybe I want to add in a little bit of extra material for it to take for a roughing pass. So now we can come in, add a little bit more material. So I can do math right in the fields of a conversational event as well with the variables. And there you go, we see it even resize the stock for us. So you can really start to get to some pretty powerful stuff, even just using these simple R variables. 
Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to now transition out of using our variables and start to show you some of the more advanced variables. So before we move any further, one of the things I did want to spend a couple minutes on is explaining to you where you guys can start to get some of the supporting information for these topics. Looks like a lot of guys are having audio problems today. Boy, I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, so sorry about that. Okay, so um, here we go. Here we have um, so, um, one of the key manuals that I wanted to point out that you can start looking for this information. So one of the one of the probably the go-to websites that I would say you'd want to use for really everything Siemens encompassing is this support industry website that I have the link here for you. So I want to show you just real quick how to kind of navigate it because it's, it's a beast of a site. There's all kinds of stuff there. So it can be a little intimidating when you first go. But in this case, if you want to get this job planning manual, this programming manual job planning, what you're going to do is go to this website, right? And when you launch it, it's going to come up and it's going to show up right here. Now you can start to try to browse through, look at manuals and downloads, but I'm going to warn you, there's going to be a lot of stuff here because it's not just Cinemeric. It's everything within the Siemens industry segment. So if you go over to the search window, and in this case, just type in job planning and do a search, she's going to bring back everything that has some form of reference to job planning in it. Now you happen to notice right here, that's 564 entities. So even now, there's a lot. So what you can do is you can use this search area filter to reduce it. So if you know you're looking for a manual, you can uncheck all of these. And what it's going to do is it's going to then reduce the search result to just include that scope. So we reduce it down, let it refilter. OK, we dropped a few. Certainly, there's a lot of manuals. Then you're going to have to kind of dig through what's here. Now, luckily, job planning pops up right up at the top. So if you simply click on this link, you can now download the file. So the way it's going to work is if there's multiple versions of the manual, they're going to give you this little version tab. And the first one is always going to be the newest manual. So 2015 is the latest manual. But if you have an older system or you want to get some documentation on some of the older systems, you can certainly come back, click on an earlier version, and this way you'll have the document for earlier versions of software as well. Once you have the version selected, just click the download field, initiate to download, save it, and you're saving a PDF. So then you'll have that manual. So I strongly suggest you guys get it because what we're going to do is one of the big sections that's supporting really everything we're talking about in this webinar is the flexible NC programming chapter. Now, this manual is a beast. It's huge. Uh, if memory serves me, I think it was like 1,000 pages or something. Just the variable flexible programming section alone is probably 150 pages, 200 pages. It's a lot. That's where you're going to want to refer and get supporting information about the content that I'm going through right now. OK. So, so where are we moving to next? So we created our variables. The problem with our variables is these are accessible to anybody. So not only anybody that's writing programs in your machine, but any background cycles that could be running. So you may or may not know when somebody's going to write to that R variable. Well, if you're just using it for a simple, simple scenario where I'm going to set it, I'm going to run that feature, and then I'm going to move on, and I don't care if it gets rewritten, well, that's OK. But what happens if you're setting it and expecting the value to maintain there? It could be written over by a measuring cycle. Specifically, you're running measuring cycles that are Siemens measuring cycles. It's quite common that I see third-party measuring cycles write to our variables, or all sorts of other peripheral components or, or cycles that could have been added to your machine's control. So if you want to have a little more control over the variables to keep this from occurring, now you can start to create your own variables. And these are what we call custom variables. So there's three different types of custom variables when you start to get into this. There's local user variables. Those are what we call LUDs. There's program global user variables. Those are what we call PUDs. And then there are global user variables. Now, there's a lot of information here, certainly a lot more than we can cover in the hour and a half or so webinar that we're working on now. 
So we're gonna, I'm going to concentrate here throughout this next segment on what I consider to be probably the most common um, features or functions used, and then you guys can explore some of the other features on your own with the supporting documentation I was talking about. So for us, we're going to concentrate on local user variables and then global user variables. Now, no matter which of the variables you're playing around with or using, there, you have to understand that within those local or global variables, there's different types of variables you can create. So here we have a list of, what, seven different variable types, integers, reals, booleans, uh, ASCII characters, strings, axis, and frames. Those are all the different variables you're going to now be able to start to create. We are going to look at three of those variables, and they're the three most common variables I would say used. You have integers. So now an integer is any number, positive or negative, that does not have a decimal place. So it's going to be a whole number, no, no decimal place to it. Um, where would I want to use an integer? Quite commonly, a spindle RPM. Spindle RPMs don't generally have a decimal place, so that would be an area where I might want to use an integer. From there, we have what we call reals, real number. And a real number is a true number. So with decimal place, plus or minus, uh, can be held out to, uh, to an exponential place. So that's what you're going to want to use in any cases where you know that you want to be able to ensure that you're passing the decimal place. Now, in some areas, like you know, feed rates and stuff, you could just use reals. Uh, if you're not too worried about it coming in with a decimal place, that's fine. But if you know there's a case where you don't want to use the decimal or it could cause problems, that's when you'd have to leverage integer. I tend to find most people, myself included, will probably veer to the real variables as we start to create them, only because more times than not, I'm going to want the decimal place. Um, also, when you use an integer, there's going to be rounding, so you're going to see that here in a second as well. So you want to be careful of that. Now, the third, I'd say, most popular variable type that we're going to look at is what we call strings. And a string is the ability of me being able to pass in any kind of word or phrase. So it's not intended to be interpreted as a numerical value or number, but just letting me pass something through to the control. So you're going to get a chance to see how to create a string and then how do you use a string. And I got a nice little example of how we can use a string to kind of get your head around it. So the first thing we're going to do is explore integers. We're going to talk about how do I create the integer. So on the left side, that's a simple little part program where we're building an integer variable. How do I set the variable? And then how would I apply the variable? And we're doing something very basic with the feed command. And then we're going to run it, and I want to show you kind of how the system's going to react as you start to use this variable. Oops, excuse me. So if we go over to our program examples, if we go to Example number three, integer, I'm now creating just a simple variable. So the way variables work when I'm going to build these LEDs or GUDs is you do have to define the variables. And again, these are all what we call LUDs. This is a local variable. Local meaning it's local to the part program. Once it gets used and the program's done, the variable is going to go away. And you're going to see that here in a second. So we have to add what's called a definition statement. Had I not put this definition statement you here see in the front, I'm going to get a alarm in the system. So if you try to use a variable or create a variable and you neglect to define it, you're going to get this block to the variable name is not unknown or defined. So if you go into your alarms and you dig into your help, it's going to start to give you a little more information. But at the end of the day, it's telling us, hey, I don't know what that command is. That, that, that's not a recognized command in our system. So you have to add the definition field. So it's as simple as typing DEF. DEF is saying I'm defining some variable. Once you've told it you're about to define something, you have to tell it the type of variable you're defining. So that's if we refer back to that page, we were showing the abbreviation INT for an integer. Well, I'm going to type INT. Then I'm going to tell it the variable name. Now. You can really create any name you want, but you want to be careful here. And there's two things you want to be careful here. You want to be careful of using a variable that exists within the system. You never want to try to use a variable that's one of our current variables. Uh, that will cause you headaches, trust me. And you also don't want to use what's called a reserved word. Uh, a reserved word would be you know, a command 
that we're potentially going to have. You know, we have like get commands, get T, you're going to see them a little later. That's to get a tool offset value. Well, I don't want to make a variable to get command because that's what we call a reserved word. So one of the simplest rules that you can use is to start all your variables with an underscore. We don't use any reserved words or variables in our system when starting with an underscore. So that's what I try to do, and it just keeps me from colliding with another variable. So here we're creating the underscore R feed, and then R feed is then going to be set in the next line by really just typing whatever the variable name is and saying equal. I don't need the spaces. You can put them if you like, but the value I'm setting it to. So here I'm setting it to a value of 10.5. Then I'm going to tell it how do I want to use it. So I can do f equals. So I'm setting my feed rate equal to whatever this variable is. I could have used it down in a position. So I could have said x equals underscore r feed. And then it would have just dumped in the value into the x field. So you can start to use these anywhere you want. So anywhere we use the r variable, I can now replace it with a local variable, an LUD variable. So what would happen if we ran this right now? Well, if I hit cycle start and I run it, it's applying it as a feed. But remember, we typed in 10.5. It rounded it to 11 because it's an integer. It's a whole number. So rounding does take into account. So if it's 0.5 or greater, it's going to round it up. If it's less than 0.5, it's going to round it down. Now, a cool little trick if you want to see any of these, these LUD variables is if you go to the offset table, and we back up and we click on the local LUD button. At the time of running, we're going to see the variable. So we're going to see what it formatted to, and we're going to see that it exists in the system. Had I let the program run to completion and get to the M30, the variable goes away. This is a local variable. Local meaning it's only exists in memory during that program run. That's why it went away. OK. So if we come back to it and get into the program, had I maybe had this slightly below, then you're going to see we run it, cycle start. Now it's rounding down to 10 as opposed to up to 11. So there's just your rounding principle. I could still go to the offset table, make sure I'm in local LED, type in the value. I see, I see what my entered value was right there. This is non-editable. This is just a, a pass-through, which is showing you what's going on. So that's how LEDs work. And, and then you can start building as many as you want. So if I wanted five or six or seven integers in a row, I would just literally start typing my definition statements. Now, you can have multiple definitions on the same line. I don't like to do that. I think it reads funny. But if I know I'm going to have a real long program and I want to keep it condensed, then um, you, you, know, you can just do a space to find the next one, space to find the next one, and so on and so forth. But you have to define all the ones you're going to want to use, set all of them, and then decide where you want to actually apply that variable. Now, additionally, we have what we call real variables. So a real variable would be that whole number, that the full value that I want to be able to pass. I want to be able to use it. So we're going to go back to our little example. We're going to show you the example of now having it built as a real. So now you're going to have the REL statement there. And we're just going to be passing the true number through. So it's going to give you the total value. So with that being said, we have that created here for you. So same rules apply, everything we just said. Difference is now I'm defining it as a real as opposed to an integer. Create whatever I want the variable name to be. Set the variable, apply it. So now if we were to run it, cycle so start, I see I have a now commanded 10.25 inch per minute. I go to the offset table for the local variable. I see the variable. And there's nothing here that tells you it was defined as a real or an integer. But if I see a decimal place, I know it has to be a real. If it was just a whole number, it could have really been defined as either or. I don't know that there's rounding happening. So that's where it's up to me to know what I did inside of the part program. All right. And then we continue it on. And just like before, once you hit M30, that variable is gone. It's no longer available anymore. All right. So those would be integers and reals. And you're going to find these are probably some of the most 
popular types of variables that you'll see get created. Um, out of CAD CAM posts, guys creating a little, little routines for them, you're going to do this kind of stuff all the time. Now the third variable that we mentioned that we're going to talk about is a string. So a string allows me to kind of pass through different things. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating a string that allows me to have uh, pass through through a variable the term finish underscore one. So I'm treating this as a, an operational command. And then I can then use a different area. So I'm going to use it inside of a message statement. So I want to be able to pass messages through and have some kind of term here. So that's what a string does. So you're going to define a string just like you did earlier. You're going to use the def statement. But now you're going to type the term string, but there's an extra modifier here. So inside of our brackets, I have to tell it how many characters I want to allow this string name to be up to. So that's what the 32 is. I can actually have a name or a word or a phrase that goes up to as large as 32 characters. Once I exceed 32, then I certainly am going to get an alarm, and I can't use it. So that's what the 32 is. And then you just say whatever the name of the variable is. That's going to be the same as you've seen before. Then you set it. Now, setting it's a little different. You do have to put it into quotes. So all strings, when setting all strings, you have to use the quote command to apply it. And then we'll figure out where we want to use it. So we're going to jump over to our example here and show you a couple of ways of the way that's going to work. Okay, so we have our string program created. We see we're defining. There is our term string. The brackets and the number is going to set how many physical places I have inside the string name. And then I gave it some variables. So I called it op name, underscore O-P-N-A-M-E. I then set op name. So there's my op name equal. Remember, I must have the quotes here. If I left the quotes out, then it's going to give me an alarm. So had I gone in and neglected to have the quotes, if you run it, you're going to get an alarm. Again, it's an unknown variable because I'm not following the proper protocol. So get my quotes in. Now, one of the areas I would say most common for using strings would be in messages. So any of you that maybe haven't ever seen the message command, a simple MSG allows me to display messages across the top of the screen. Now, normally when you use a message command by yourself, longhand, you put whatever you want to message inside a quotation. And this is where strings get a little funny. You have to use quotations when setting the variable, but you don't use quotations when using it inside of a message command. Because what happens is anything in quotations is passed through directly. It's saying, hey, I want to just write on the screen whatever sits between these two quotes with the message statement. So that's where you see the op name. Well, we don't want op name. We want finish one. So if I come back to my program and I just get rid of these two quotations, now the system's going to pass through finish one. So you can start to display custom messages this way. I would say probably the most, the second most common ways to use strings is in engraving. So if you want to use our engraving cycle, but you want to be in changing the text inside the engraving cycle, well, you could use a variable in the engraving cycle and then be feeding it from this. Um, so it's just another area. It's just another way. In fact, if you use the, um, the variable method inside of engraving for variable name, and you use our pre-created variable, that's just the GUD. That's just one pre-created in the system. And all that variable is is a string. So this is just the mechanism to have made that. So that's another area where you would certainly see it. But uh, I'd say probably most commonly I see strings used for message statements. OK. So that's how I start to build these different custom variables. Now what happens if I don't, don't want to have to build the variable every time? So let's say you're, you're setting up, um, you are, uh, you, you know, you use the same variables time and time and time again, and you don't want to have to define them over and over again. Well, you can create what we call custom global user data variables, and you can build your own tables of variables. So a lot of times we'll see this when somebody's creating custom cycles for our system. 
uh, random shelf records take. They like to build custom GUD tables, and those are the variables that they use to read and write to when they're running the cycles and doing measuring routines. Um, certainly, you know, there's other people that are making peripheral add-on features within the Siemens control that might build GUDs, but end users can certainly create GUD tables as well. So really, it's, and it's any case where I don't want to have to keep doing the definition statements time and time again, because it's the same variable I'm always going to use. So where you find these is under the GUD selection button, you'll get a list of all pre-created GUD tables. So whenever you're going to build one, probably the first thing would be knowing what's in the system, looking here and seeing what GUD tables already exist. Then from there, you can build them. So here, we're going to show you how to build your global user variables, your GUD tables. And there's a whole bunch of different um, formats of GUDs. So we support SGUDs. These are really referred to as a system GUD or a Siemens GUD. These are reserved to us. There's MGUDs. M usually refers to manufacturer, so that would be for the OEM. And then we do have user GUD table. That's the UGUD, so you could build this. Or you can create from a table from the name GUD4 up to GUD9. So our example, we're going to build a simple table called GUD5. What's going to happen or how does it work? Well, we're going to get in back into the system data area. Um, we're going to create what's called a definition file. The definition file is going to have this instructions commands that you see on the left side of the screen. And once we initiate that, it's going to actually go in and it's going to build a GUD table. So the process steps to do it is go to definitions. Once you're in definitions, you're going to hit the new button. We go to new, we're going to assign the name of the table. Once we have signed the name, it's automatically going to go into an editor. And that's what I see here in the lower right-hand corner. I type in some simple instructions, which we'll explain in a second. Close the file, and it asks me, do I want to activate this GUD? Once I say OK, then it's going to build the GUD table. So I'm going to see a, a little bar graph coming across showing me the status of build. If I've done everything correctly, I'm going to get an activation has been completed, and then we're going to see not only a GUD definitions file under the definitions folder, but more importantly, when I go to the offset table, we're going to get the GUD variables. So we are going to build a GUD5 table. We're going to use or create these instruction commands to build it, and then we're going to show you kind of how to use them inside of a part program and just some of the, the benefits over creating it as an LUD table. So the first thing we have to do is actually build the table. So if I go to my offset table and I look under my GUDs, sorry, go to GUD selection, and I'm going to see whatever GUDs are currently available. So right now I just have the system or the Siemens GUDs inside here that are already built. So I want a new button right there, and it's going to say GUD5. So that's just telling me that none of those other GUDs have been set up in the system. So where do I get to go, or what do I have to go for the definition creation? Select menu select, go to setup, and go into system data. And you're going to want to make sure your password is in, your manufacturer password is in when you're creating these. Go to system data, and then under system data, you're going to look for the NC data folder. Under NC data, there's a folder called definitions. This is where your GUD tables coexist. So we have a couple of GUD table definition files already here, default in the system, and we're going to build a new one. So just have your highlight on definitions or anywhere within here, select new, and now you can start to type the name. Now you can do a pull down, and it gives you uh, the recommendation for the GUDs that you can make, or I can just type the name. So had I started just typing GUD, and I could pick it here. Now you see this one has four through seven. I said earlier there's um, there's a nine. Um, I believe that that is limited by a machine MD. So it's up to the OEM when they commission some of these default machines uh, MDs how many GUD uh, tables they're going to allow you to build. So if you see a difference, you're just going to want to use obviously uh, one of the numbers available to you here. So we're going to use GUD five and select OK. Now. I'm going to go, I would have to start typing these instructions. So what I did is for simplicity's sake, save us some time, 
uh, I created a little program with the instructions already done for me. But I'm going to explain them in one second. We're going to actually add in a couple other things here. So we're inside of the GUD file. So when I want to create variables in here, I'm going to define it like you just saw before. So the, the statement's very similar to what you were seeing, uh, creating local, G, local variables. So I type in DEF, but I do now have to tell, us, tell it if it's going to be a channel-specific variable or a global-specific, meaning it's going to be able to use for multiple channels. If I want a global variable, which is usually what I set most of my GUDs up to be, I use the term N. CK, and that's going to denote that it's going to be a global variable. Then decide what I want that variable type to be. So integers, reals, strings, you know, the variables we were talking about. Assign a variable name. Now, if you want a bunch of them, you can create what we call indexes. So in this case, inside the brackets or inside the index, I'm saying, hey, I want you to build six variables. The system's going to automatically start at the number of zero and go right up through. So it's going to give me a variable called underscore feed, brackets zero, right up through brackets five. Then I'm going to do the same thing for my, my m spin command. I'm going to get six variables automatically created. Now, additionally, you know, let's say I didn't want to have a bunch of them. I just wanted to have uh, one. I just want to have a, a unique variable. And maybe I'm going to make it an integer. So I can type it in here, and I'll do my underscore test. And that's going to just build me a singular vari variable that I can use. Another trick that's kind of neat is what if I want to have a default value? So I can create an integer, and I can call it test2. But if I want it to automatically assign a value to the variable on PowerUp, I can give it a value here just by simply saying equal to 10. Now, once you set it in the part program, it's going to overwrite this, um, and it'll maintain that until you reboot the system. But once you reboot, it's going to put this back as the default. So you can even set up default values in your variables. Once uh, final, before we're done, I'm building a string. So a string is going to be a one-shot deal. So remember, this is just going to give me a single variable that's going to be 32 characters. So that's going to look just like the string definition we just used before. Once you've wrote everything, you want to simply close the program. And that's what's going to ask me, do I want to activate this GUD table I just built? Say OK. And now you're building the GUD table. So it's just going to kind of come through. You're going to see a little bar graph come. I'm going to take advantage of this and have a sip of water. And if everything's good, the activation has been completed successfully. So simply say OK, and you should see your table created. There's some size now to it, and it's green. And the green is the indicator that it's active. Now at any point, just like any other program, you can open it up. You can hit the blue arrow over to open it. You can make changes here if you want to. It's, that's not a problem. You know, If I wanted to add a few more variables, you just once you close it, it's going to detect that there was a change, and it's going to just go through the same initiation process. So what do we get? Well, let's go look. So go to my offset table, go to my GUD selection tab, and now you see we got a GUD5. Our GUD5 gave us six variables starting at zero up through five, underscore feed. So now when I call them out, I would call underscore feed index zero, and you'll see that in a second. I got my spindle variables here. I even got my single integer and my integer with a default value of 10. So now if I change this, I can change it all I want, but when I reboot the system, it goes back to a default value. I could have done that same thing with the uh, with the string. So here I have a string, and then I can type in, you know, finish or whatever I want the string to contain, um, or set it from a part program. So once the table's built, then you can start to use it. So what does it really give us? Well, the big thing with GUDs is I don't need the definition statements anymore. So here, I can just immediately say, OK, well, what do I want to set it at? Feed 0 equals the value, right? So here, I got a feed 0, 10, a feed 1, a 5. Set up my spindle. So I'm using those as spindle commands, 0, 1, 1,500, 2,500. And then in the part program, 
when I want to use my spindle, I did my s equals and the variable name. Now, since there's an index associated with it, I do have to type the index, the bracket zero. In the conversational cycle, I just literally typed underscore feed bracket zero, and it's going to use that value. So it's now going to feed the first cycle at 10 inches a minute, feed the second cycle at 5 inches a minute. So if I look at my little part program, we can go simulate. It now comes in, setting these variables. I didn't have to do those extra definition statements. Certainly, if I had used the test uh, two variable, um, what's nice with that is now I don't have to set it at all because there's a default value to it. So we had a value of 10. So maybe here I said uh, underscore, don't forget your underscore. So this has to match exactly the way test two. So I haven't set test two anywhere. Actually, that was probably not a great one because we were using this as 10. Um, that doesn't really matter. Just just show you. Okay, so with test two there, it's still going to be using 10, but now it's using 10 because test two is set to 10. Now, if you do set it, so if I type in underscore test two equals a number, then I'm going to see that this value will have changed, but then it'll maintain that change until I set it again or I reboot the system. But this is a nice, simple, quick way to set up default variables. Okay. So again, you know, I, I like to use the GUDs. There's obviously a couple of steps to creating them, but I, I like to do that when they're variables that I use consistently over and over again. If it's a post, you don't mind seeing the definitions every time when it's posted out of a CAM system. It's not the end of the world. Um, you know, if you are developing something to use variables for somebody else, like you're a post developer and you want to create variables, well, you're probably not going to want to tell a customer, hey, let's build custom GUD tables on every machine you develop a post for. So that's a scenario where you'd use an L, you do as opposed to a GOD. Um, so, you know, you've got you to kind of take this stuff with the application in mind, what fits best. So what if we want to start combining them a little bit? Um, so certainly you're not limited to one or the other. You can bounce in and out. So here's a basic example where we're going to have some local variables, some LUDs, as well as applying some GUDs right in the same part program. So when we look at this in example seven, for the LUDs, I got to remember to do the definition statement. For the GUDs, just set them if they, if they don't have a default value or if there's not a number there currently. Um, and then go ahead and start running and start executing your part program. So, you know, some of this stuff you do find that you do like a little bit of a, an intermix between, between one and, and the other. And then it's going to certainly work um, the same way that I I see before, you know, here I can start to change. Now, this case is probably a real common area where I see um, local variables get created, especially out of KCAM systems, and it's a great way to handle it. So we're going to use the super command, which is our retract command to go to a safety location, maybe before a tool change or something. But I might have this command 30 times inside of a part program, and maybe this part program is big. Well, last thing a user wants to do is have to find the 30 locations of SUPA to make a change just because the CAM system came with, you know, wanted it to go to one area for a safety retract, but you want to tweak it somewhere else. So now at the very beginning of the program, we can set where our home location is, and that's where it'll go before tool changes or just a safety retract for somebody to come in. So this is a pretty common area to start to use these um, local variables. Additionally, we use the feed and the spins that we had before to do the other aspects. So again, you're not limited to one or the other. You can use these things and interchange between them all you want. But it's important to now talk about handling sub-programs because this is the next area where you really start to get into when you start to play around with these types of variables. So GUDs not only transcend channels, but they're there for any program to access. When you use LEDs, 
they're only available in the main program or in the program that I want to say main program in the program they were set in. So if I set an LUD or define an LUD in a sub program, it's there for use in the sub, but it's not there in the main. So you have to do double definitions when you use LUDs. So this is another area where maybe GUDs are a better way to go if you're passing a lot of variables back and forth and you don't have to want to have to type in the definitions every single time. So what I have set up here is a quick little example of a main program. So what this is going to do is this is going to go and machine some toolpath and then once I get down to it, I'm going to call up a sub program that's going to do something else. Now, what I did just to show you, I have this set up right now to actually fail. Um, I did add what's called a stop read command in. The stop read is our, our stop look ahead, basically. So it's going to let the program run all the way to this point before it looks any further. So this way, I don't get an alarm immediately. So what would happen if I ran this program the way it stands? I hit cycle start. She's going to run. She's going to do her thing up until the sub. Once it gets to the subroutine, it's almost immediately going to come back and say, hey, hey, I got a problem. I have an unknown variable. Well, first thing you're probably going to tell yourself is, well, I already set Z home. That exists. It's, it's in my program. And it's real easy to kind of get lose where you are when you start to jump in and out of main programs, sub programs, especially when you get to like nested sub programs. So the first thing you want to do when you're in auto and there, you got an alarm up and you're a little confused as to where the alarm is being fed from, you want to hit the program levels button. This is very important. So program levels shows you how deep you are inside of subprograms. So here immediately I can say, well, I'm executing the main. I've already jumped into the sub. If I was still in the main program, the sub program wouldn't even show up here. This is where I'm currently at, and this is where the alarm is being thrown. So if I reset it, come back into the main. Now it's neat in version 4.7, which we're running right now, when I have external calls or subcalls, I can open them up from the main program by hitting the blue arrow to the right. And here, I see I was using the super command. Well, that's a local variable. It's not a global variable. So I had never defined it. Right now, I have the comments in here just so they're not using them. So what you have to do in this case is because I'm jumping between programs and locals are only local to that program, I do have to redefine them again. So now, had I run this part program, we'll run it all from the beginning, does its thing. Once it's there, it's going to jump into the subroutine and goes around. So just start paying attention when you're playing around with these locals and globals, uh, where you are, how you're applying them. You know, in that sub, we had also used uh, one of the globals, and again, I didn't have to do anything with this. This GUD is already exists. So you only run into these scenarios when you're setting local variables. Okay. Good. So let's move on. And we are going to certainly take some questions at the end because I'm sure there's a lot of questions for this material. There's a lot of stuff here. Okay. So we, we're, we're using our variables. We're now creating our own custom variables. But there's a whole host of pre-created variables, system variables, um, that I can start to pull data from the machine. You know, hey, maybe I want to know what the tool length is for the tool that's in spindle. Or, you know, what state the spindle's in. Is it running? Is it not running? There's a whole bunch of stuff I can start to query. Your go-to manual is going to be the uh, parameters manual called system variables. So just like we did before, go to your support industry systems web page, type in system variables. You can see the manual come up. You can download it there. Um, there's certainly more manuals than that. Um, if you really start to get into these higher level, um, higher level programming and you're really querying a lot, um, send me an email. I can certainly recommend a, a few more. There's a tool management manual that I find is priceless when you get into some of this stuff. But certainly the previous manual, the job planning, and the system variables, boy, that's, that's step one. That's exactly where you want to be referencing as you start to go and move into some of this content. So I wanted to show you, again, <laughs> a lot of information here. We're going to just concentrate on some of the probably the more uh, common variables that I find myself using. And we're going to talk about 
channel specific system variables. So those are variables that are being set and only reside for that specific channel. And also tool parameters. Tool parameters can be used for creating tools from a part program, modifying tools from a part program. So there's a lot of different variables that can be found in these manuals that can be very, very helpful when you're trying to do some type of task. So the first one I wanted to spend a little time in is your tool parameters area. Now tool parameters, they're typically viewed as you see on the left side. It's going to be a TC underscore and some kind of a uh, some kind of a TP, DP kind of string, uh, TC stands for tool carrier. Um, just, just to give you some common ones, uh, the TC underscore TP1, that's sister tools or, or Duplo tools, what we used to call them in the older system. So those are two tools that exist in the carousel that are associated, that can be interchanged from tool life management's perspective. And that is an integer. TP2, that's your tool identifier name. So when you build a tool in the Siemens system, like you see over here, cutter32, that's the name that we always get used to, and that is a string. Now, what you don't realize, um, and then we're going to get into that a little bit later, is when you build a tool in the Siemens control and you assign your name, we immediately assign an associated number in the background, and that number is how we track the tool. So a lot of times you'll build a tool in the system and you have no idea that it's being referred to from our end, from the system variable end, as tool number six. Well, if I'm just picking the tool, or assigning it to a program and running it, I don't, I don't care. But when you want to start to write tools, create tools, then you have to know this, this variable, this number. So this is where you can start to get into working with some of this stuff. So we got magazine locations, tool status, um, tool type, um, you know, is it an end mill, is it a turning tool, what is it, a drill, um, cutting edge position, have multiple orientation, uh, my tool lengths, tool radiuses. So there's a ton of variables in here. So we're going to show you just some of the, um, the minimum variables I would need to start to play around in this area. So what I've created, I've created two different programs for you. And what these programs are going to do is both of them will create a tool for you automatically from a part program, a tool that does not exist in the offset table. However, the results are going to be a little bit different. So in my first example, example nine, this is what I call the tool creation and mod program. So in this case, I assume that I know that I'm going to write over tool 50. So tool number 50 is going to be assigned a name. Now you got to watch this because there could be a tool 50 in the system ready. You may or may not know that. So if you're going to write to the specific tool number, you do need to know all of the tool numbers of the tools in your system currently. And then you can start to write to it. Now, if I don't know the tool numbers and I want to create new tools, that's when we're going to get into example 10. And this will go you an example of how to create a new tool and it will automatically assign the next available number. Now, there's pros and cons to both, so we're going to explore it a little bit. But this starts to show you how you can really play around with these, these tool variables. So if we go to the program, inside of Train, we have example nine. Here, I am going to build a tool. The tool's name is it's going to be 1234-inch end mill, and it's going to be using the internal tool number of 50. So first question you probably have is, well, how do I know what the number of the tools I have in the system are? So if you go to your offset table, jump over to the tool list, pick some tool. I don't care which one you pick. It doesn't matter. Highlight a tool. Expand your vertical keys over. You need to go into details and then into internal data. Now, I'm running 4.7, latest software. This button used to be called further data. It's the exact same function. We just changed the label. But when you come in, this is showing you all of the background info that gets created when you start building tools. And one of the first things you look for is the assigned tool number. So cutter 16 is assigned number 4. Had this been number 50 and I run that ran a little program, I would have overwritten this tool. So that's why you want to be careful. If you're going to derive things from the tool numbers, you're going to have to kind of create yourself your own library of tools knowing, okay, number 50 is always going to be my one, two, three, four, end mill. 
and that's going to keep me from having a duplicate. But the minute people start making tools now at the control, they could, because it's automatically assigned, inadvertently build a tool 50. Okay, so let's show you how it works. So here's this little program. So this is kind of bare minimum what you're going to start to need when building a tool. Um, here I'm assigning my TP Carrier 1, saying that this is my first sister tool, so it's not going to make any duplicate tools. I'm assigning the name of the tool with TP2, and that's my string. You know all about strings now. I'm defining a location type. So this has to do with whether it thinks the tool's oversized or not. Um, we have a tool status. And then we have the type of tool, end mills, drills. And you can start to find all this information for what all these, these different variables mean in that, that, that software, or I mean those manuals. I am now assigning a length and a radius. So I like to use this mechanism uh, when I'm working with guys with external presetters. And they want to be able to create a file that I can run on the machine to not only build tools, but write to offsets of tools. So if I was to look at the offset table, there is no tool with the name 1234nmil in it. If I go over and run this program, it looks pretty uh, uneventful, right? Like it almost didn't run. It actually ran really quickly in the background. And what it did was it created 1234nmil. So now this is where things are a little different. So had I run this program a second time, and it doesn't matter where the tool is located, so whether it's in the mag or not in the mag, I'm going to change my offset to 6. If I run this a second time, cycle start, it's going to go in, and it's just going to modify that portion of the offset. So if I have pre-created tool library, and I want to be able to just update offsets of the tool, that's how I would want to do it. I would want to use this type of method. But again, I'm calling out a specific tool number, so I want to make sure that there's no other tool 50 inside as far as our assigned tool number. And if you go back to that detail screen and internal data, that's where you see the 50 that I was using. That's what's inside those brackets. Now the other method and the other program I created for you does some different things. It's kind of a little trickier. So here, we're using a couple new commands, and the biggest thing we're using is the new T command. So our new T command is what we call one of those reserved words, like we talked about earlier, right? Don't create a variable that potentially could be a reserved word. New T is a reserved word. If you had created a variable called new T, that could have given you problems. Okay, so the new T command allows me with that and just a couple additional variables. Here I'm using TP7, TP8, DP1, DP3 and DP6, because I want to get my lengths and my radiuses in. This will automatically build a tool with a new assigned number to it. So if I run this part program, and it's going to build a tool named test, I go to my offset table. Now I get a tool named test. If I look at my details, I will find out that it automatically assigned a number of 66. It's probably the next available number based on all the different tools I have. So it's just kind of using these, these numbers randomly whenever it realizes that that one hasn't been used. OK. Now, this is the limitation to this method. Had I wanted to run that program again, whether I changed a value in it, you know, maybe I'm going to make this 6 like we did before, or did something else, in the method that this is set up to now, it's going to alarm out and say, hey, you already have a tool that's already been built with this name test. And it's not going to let you go any further. So it's going to give you an alarm. If I go to the offset table, it didn't make any changes to the tool. So this is good if you know that you want to, it's a one-time write, and you don't want to potentially ever overwrite it again if the tool exists in the library. This would be the way I would, I would use this. Additionally, I can change it around a little bit, getting some different results. So in the new T command, there is this comma one, and that's that's here fixing the sister tool to a value of one. Now, if I don't use this instruction, and I just modify the instruction ever so slightly by getting rid of the comma one, it's now going to assign a new sister tool number. So every time I run this program, 
I will get a new tool with a new sister tool number to it. So if I keep running this program, I'm not going to overwrite the existing tool, but it's going to build a new tool for me. So if you use sister tools, this can be an extremely handy method of creating multiple tools in the system. So I point all this stuff out because there's just these slight nuances that you can play around with these commands and get very, very different results. So just keep an eye on it. You know, if, if you don't fully understand it, play around with it, try it. But you got to kind of watch these different scenarios because all these, these different features can happen just by tweaking the commands a little bit. And again, you start to go to do those manuals because that's where you can dig into all the nuances of these different commands, you know, like this, this new T command for argument's sake. Okay, so that's how we can start to create um, create tools using the tool variables. And again, this is all feeding out of that um, pre-created system variables manual. Now, what if I want to use what we call channel-specific variables? So sometimes I might want to figure out, well, hey, for one, what is the assigned tool number to the tool that's sitting in the spindle? You know, this is a common thing. You know, I happen to know the tool name, but I don't know what the system assigned a number. And if I'm doing things through a part program, I don't have the luxury of telling the part program, hey, go to the offset table and read this field. You got to figure it out. So commands like the dollar sign P underscore tool number let me query or let me check a tool that's physically in the spindle and then pass back information so I can then figure things out. So I could say, okay, I want to write to that tool, but I don't, I want to write to the, the tool that's in the spindle, but I don't know what the assigned number is. So I can set an R variable equal or a, a, or a local variable or a global equal to this variable and then figure out what the assigned tool number. Or maybe I want to pull the tool length. Depending how the machine gets commissioned, you may see similar commands um, that you have to apply. So if you find yourself bouncing between a lot of different types of machines, depending on how they commission the tool management side of the control, you know, you may need to use these get commands in place. And, and they do very similar features. So I have a little program here we can, we can fool around with. But this is kind of where we can start to use um, these variables. So if I wanted to do something, oops, sorry, like just query the, 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 the number of the active tool, here you could sit there and say, okay, R7 is going to be equal to my dollar $P underscore tool number. And then if I ran this and I go back to R7, I'll then see whatever the assigned tool number is for the tool that's sitting in the spindle. So you're going to find yourself probably doing a mix of these things. So what I did was I created a little retract program for you, and I'm creating some local variables. Um, I'm also querying to figure out some certain things about the spindle. So a retract routine is a real common and real helpful thing to create, because how often do we want to you know, stop the machine, pause it, send the spindle to a safe spot, and then get in and do something. Um, and this is usually where you use the super command. Well, instead of having to type out or having to have the CAD CAM system post all of that instruction all the time, what I'm going to do in my main is I'm going to use the word retract. And the retract is going to be associated with a subprogram. And in the subprogram, we're going to have some pretty cool stuff going on. So what do we got? What are we doing here? Give me a second. Let's come back out. So let's first look at the main. The main is going to be real simple. I'm going to load a tool, fire up my spindle, position it somewhere, come down, and then I want the machine to go to a safety location. So the way subs work, um, and I am going to do a webinar in the not-so-distant future digging into subroutines even more because I think there's a lot of important stuff to talk about from the subroutine perspective, but at a very simple level, if I just basically type the name of a file, or just, just the name, the system will automatically assume, hey, I think he's trying to call up a subroutine. And it's going to look at the folder that I'm in, as well as the part program and subprogram folder, and see if there's a file with the name retract. If it finds it, it's, this, it's then going to move along and start to use that, that program, that subroutine. Sorry, 
Okay. And then we're going to have our physical retract subroutine. So that's going to be here, and that's going to have some, some logic to it. Okay. So what did we do when we wanted to use this, this retract command? And I actually have to update my program because I don't have the underscore 11. So here, I'm defining a couple real variables to set my home location. I'm also defining two extra integers, and I'm going to call it D number, and that's going to associate to my cutting edge number, right? You know, those of us that are familiar in running a Siemens control, you have this D number. D number is multiple cutting edges, right? So here, this tool one has three separate offsets, D123. Well, if I'm going to do a retract, one of the things I have to do is I have to suppress my tool offsets by canceling my D number. When I'm done, I got to reinstate the D number if I want to do something additionally with the offset activated. Well, this is where things always become an issue when I'm doing this type of routine. If I assume D1 when I'm done, but I really was running D2, I just loaded the wrong tool offset. So what we can do is we can use some of these system variables to figure out some things about the tool that's in the spindle. So in my case, I'm going to check and say, hey, whatever tool that's in the spindle, I want you to pass with the ptool command the actual D number value and write it to this D number variable. I'm also going to do something a little different. I want to check the status of the spindle and write that to my spindle state command. So now, when I do my SUPA, I can cancel my tool offset. I can set it to rapid. I can position my Z up and the max and Y to go to um, whatever location I have set here in my um, local variable setting. And now, if I say I have an optional stop, I'm going to shut the spindle off and wait. Well, once the user hits cycle start, we are now going to reissue the correct D number by just giving it a D equal underscore D number command, that's going to say, okay, well, whatever we figured out the D number was before, let's drop it in. I check the spindle state. I say, okay, well, he was running. We're going to turn him back on again. So there I'm doing an M code equals spindle state, and I return back to my program. So if we run this now in the main, and I want to just update this, All right, so that's going to jump to that program. Now we run this cutter 20. She's going to come in, jump over, and return back. Now, in this case, I didn't have an op stop in, so it went in and out of the program pretty quickly. Had I turned the op stop on, now it jumps in, stops my spindle, I could get in, I can move, open up my doors, do whatever I want, and once I issue my cycle start, it's going to reload. So you see how there aren't any tool offsets active because the D was canceled at the D0. The D number equals, and I can do a little single block, reinstates the D number, reinstates the previous M code that was issued. That was what I wrote to spindle state. Comes back out. Continue running the program until I get to the end. So this is where you can start to use and use these system variables to get some pretty powerful information and create some, some custom cycles. Certainly just an easy one. I wanted to keep these examples as simple as I possibly could so you can kind of get your head around the material. I know you, I know you guys are going to come up with a lot more complicated stuff than, than I have. Okay, so we're, we're getting along. We're almost there. But the next big section to talk about is logic statements. So, okay, great, I'm building variables, um, I'm writing different things, but what happens if I want to now have some conditionals? You know, hey, I, I wrote a variable, I set it, what if I want to compare different variables? What if I want to make logical decisions in the part program based on things conditionals that I created? Whether it's, hey, go check a tool offset. Is that tool offset within a tolerance that I'm ha happy with or not? I can create a little tool check program. We're going to do that actually shortly in a second, show you how to do stuff like that. Um, or maybe it's a case where, you know, I create my own counters and stuff. You know, you can go pretty crazy here. So 
There's a bunch of different ways or commands we can use for comparison when we get to logic operations. I can use, I can compare things to say, hey, are two values equal to each other? That would be the double equal sign. So whenever I see a double equal sign, it's saying, hey, is this variable equal to that variable? If they are, let's go on to what comes next. Or if I want to say, are they not equal? So just make sure you don't do what's coming next unless they're not equal. That's the two bracket command that we see here. I can do greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. And then you get into some, some more statements like and or 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 not logic. You can get, excuse me, you can get into bit by bit logic. So we're going to concentrate just like we did before on the most common, and I would say the most common is your basic regional operator, which would be equal to, not equal to, greater than, less than, and examples of kind of how it will work you see here on the right. So I could do like an if statement and say, hey, if R10 is greater than or equal to 100, then go to dest, D-E-S-T. So then it's going to search forward and find wherever, wherever the label dest is and then continue on. If it's not equal to, or in this case it's saying, or if R11 is equal to R10 and less than 100, then go to dest. And using the go to statement, we're going to look at that here in a second as well. So this is an example of how I can start to build these little conditionals. So just like comparing, I got to then point or go to somewhere. So here there's a couple different ways to do it. Um, one of the pretty common ones is using go to commands. So we have go to B, go to F, go to, and go to C. The three most common that you're going to see probably applied to cycles that you're, you're using is going to be the go to B, go to F, or go to. So what does go to B mean? It's saying, hey, I want you to look backwards from where you came. So maybe I'm at line 100, and I say, I go back and look for a label or look for an end number that previously happened. It's looking back up the program. Go to F is saying, look forward. And it's going to then say, okay, I'm at line 100. I'm going to keep looking down line 200, 300, 400, whatever, but I'm moving forward in the program. Go to is going to look forward as well. But fundamentally, the difference is go to forward will end when it hits an M30. It's not going to look any further. A go to command will go forward until it hits the M30 and then start back at the beginning. So you might get the results of a go to back with a go to command, but it could take a little longer because it's going to scan all the way through the program, then start from the beginning again, and then get to that label, whether it's an end number or whatnot. So if I get long programs, uh, it's really helpful to use the directional commands. Uh, when you're first getting into it, you're probably just going to use the go-to, especially if you're making little simple, smaller routines. You don't care if it does the, the, the wind over and back. Um, the only time it could be an issue for you is if you're using the same label in multiple spots and you purposely wanted it to go back. Um, you might catch the wrong one if you just use the go-to. I would say try to avoid that. Try to use unique labels wherever you can because you can certainly uh, confuse things. Um, a lot of guys like to use end numbers as go-to markers. And that's okay. I'll be honest with you. I use them myself. It's quick, down, and dirty. So I could say go to space N30, and she will jump to N30. There's two problems with using end numbers. One, if you add anything to the program and you resequence the end numbers, N30 could change, and then i got to remember to change all my go-to statements. Two, um, from a from a go-to scenario, um, when, I, when I'm looking for N30, um, I could have multiple N30s in the same program. You get the large files, CAD CAM-based programs. It's pretty common to see them just say, hey, I'm going to output 1,000 N numbers and start over again, and start over again. So it's, it's not going to keep running the N numbers up infinitely. Well, then you might have multiple N30s in the same program. That could be bad. So be careful. Certainly you want to try to point to unique values or unique features within the program. Second way to kind of move things around, add some logic would be if and then statements, if, else, and if. So these are true or false conditionals. Um, so we have a little example of a tool chain macro program on the right. And in this case, we're defining a couple variables with the def integer statements. 
we do a stop read because we want to make sure that we did all this stuff and that the look ahead didn't keep looking until it completed all these previous commands. That's the stop read. Um, so that's not stopping your motion. What that's doing is stopping the controls look ahead until you caught up to this line. Can be can be extremely handy, especially sometimes you look ahead and might grab a command before you ever wanted it to be issued. That's where you use the stop read. Then they're saying, hey, if dollar sign p underscore is test. So it's saying, hey, if I'm in test mode, test mode is um, my program test mode in the auto run screen. So that's when I check the box and say I want to run, but I don't want the servos to move. It's saying if I'm in test mode, and then it's saying, okay, and then the variable I created earlier, which is a variable for a pre-selected tool number, if that's equal to the P tool number, which is the current tool, right? So now we're, we're back to the variables we were using a little earlier, system variables, I'm saying, hey, if, if that variable and the one in the spindle is the same, then move on. If it's not, then do the next line. So these are your conditional statements, your if, else, and end if statements. Final command I'm going to show you in this webinar is the loop and the end loop statement. And this can be extremely handy when you get to a point where you want to kind of trap somebody. And when I say trap somebody, you know, you're going to start to create maybe your own messages, your own custom messages. Um, so what we're going to show you is we're going to do a little validation of a tool check. And then we're going to create an error condition thinking that, hey, maybe my tool's broken because I, I got an issue with the numbers that are coming back from the previous offset to the current red offset after I measured the tool. Well, you, you can get into an infinite loop with this little loop and end loop command. And what this is going to do is it's going to say, hey, just kind of keep me here and force a user to hit reset to cancel the command. A uh, cycle start won't keep them going. See, that's always the fear sometimes. You want to think about when you start to say, okay, go to this and then stop, and you're going to stop at the program zero. An end user could just hit cycle start and keep on going. Well, you may not want them to ever be able to keep on going because there's something that needs operator intervention. So that's where you can use these little uh, loop statements. Another way to do that would be with a while and an end while statement. You can capture things. Um, while and end whiles, that would be, that's really popular if you want to have like a counter. So you want to loop it, but only a certain amount of times or only while a certain condition is, is being made. Um, so now you can have a little counter. Um, so maybe it's a case where, you know, you're, you're making sure that somebody sets an override to 100% and you're going to keep looping them in this conditional until they adjust the override to 100%. That's a place where you can use a, a while and an end while type of statement. So what I did as our final example, <laughs> we've gone through a lot today, um, we created a simple little tool breakage detection program. I created two. We have a basic tool breakage detection program and then one that uses the little loop command. And I will show you kind of how both would work. And this is going to give us a chance to kind of wrap everything up, see an example of using all these different types of variables, and, and as well we're going to have some conditional commands or some logic statements. And we're going to go in and we're going to make a couple of simple decisions. So in my case, I want to take a tool that's in the spindle. I want to go measure it. Once I measure it, I want to take that data, compare it to my previous tool length offset, and then make a decision on what's about to happen, and then move on. And I'm using this as a basic tool breakage detection scenario. So let's segue over to Sinutrain. Let's go on in. And now we're going to take a look at my two final examples. So example 12 is going to be a tool check, tool break detection. But in this case, I'm going to allow the operator to potentially move on. So how does it work? Well, as on any program, probably going to want to load some tool, do my tool change. And now I'm going to check and say, OK, let me capture the data of the tool length offset. So right now what it's capturing for the 5 8 inch end mill, and wherever my 5 8 inch end mill is hiding, it's hiding here somewhere. Trust me, it's there. Yep, right there. It's going to capture whatever the current offset is. Then in the program, we're going to use a measuring cycle. 
So this is our tool measuring cycle. I got to this cycle by just expanding my variable keys, keys over, going to measure tool, and then telling it what type of tool I was going to measure, right? And we'll come out of this. So I'm going to come in, do my standard stuff I normally would to, to tell it to go measure a length and write the offset. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to write to some variable. I was just using our variables to keep it simple here. I want you to write the now current tool, so the offset that is now uh, assigned to the tool that's in the spindle. And then I'm going to add in some kind of a tolerance. So if I wanted to say, once my offset, my previous offset and my new offset are, have a difference greater than 5 thou, then I have a problem. So that's where my if statement came in. So here I did a, a logic statement saying, I want you to compare my new variable to my previous variable. And if the new variable is less than or equal to R15, I want you to then go down to N20. And N20 captures a quick little message of my tool break detected. Else, meaning this conditional isn't the case, then jump down to N21 and potentially keep on moving through the program. So why would I want to keep on moving here? Well, maybe it's a case where I'm going to say, okay, um, uh, you know, I detected that there's there's no no breakage, so I want to continue to use this tool. So that would be pretty logical. So normally, if I were to run this program, it's going to come in. Now, certainly. I'm going to measure it, and it's a perfect tool because it's all virtual. So it's going to keep giving me a valid check. But to show you um, and to kind of show you the trigger of it detecting a breakage, I'm going to just change this value to an infinite. So now I know they're going to be equal to. And let's show you the conditional statement that would now occur. So it goes, it measures, it says, oh, those two values are the same or within this outside of this tolerance band. It jumped down to the message and then said, I'm detecting a tool breakage, right? Tool breakage detection. So there's my little custom routine. Now at this point right now, because I'm only grabbing or holding them at an M0, if I hit cycle start, the program's gonna continue on. Now my continue on is only to an M30. The real continue on could have been keep running that tool. So, so why would I want to allow a user to pass by this? Well, that could have been a case where in this conditional statement, I now have a portion in that program to then go check the system for sister tools. If there's a sister tool available, go grab that and continue running. Um, or there might be some other reason uh, as to why I might want to let it pass by. If I want to make sure that there's no way that this operator can move on because I know this tool's bad, there's no other way other than stopping the machine and replacing the tool, this is where using the loop statement comes in. So the loop statement, all you do is simply trap or capture with a loop and an end loop whatever you want to keep displaying, in this case my message command. So now if I run the same, and again I have the the check negated, so it'll automatically force it to go to this conditional. Hit cycle start. So it gets down into the tool breaks detection. I can hit cycle start all day long. The system's never going to let me pass this point, forcing a user to then reset, rewind the program. So if he keeps starting it over from the top, he's just going to keep getting hit by the tool breakage section. So that would be certainly a condition where the loop statement would keep me from being able to advance. You know, you're going to you're going to kind of make your own decisions as you start to methodize these little routines and macros as to what you want to let happen. Uh, I just really kind of want to give you the tools right now um, showing you there's a bunch of different ways to start to approach this. We've only scratched the surface here. There's a lot more. Um, start looking at the manuals I recommended. Reach out to me if you have some questions, um, but certainly this opens up a whole new world of things you can do with your Siemens in America control. So start to play around with it, start to use some of this function. I think you're going to be pretty impressed. Um, so with that said, I have now talked for an hour and 42 minutes. I'm going to let you guys get the opportunity to ask some questions. So um, there's a Q&A panel there in front of you. 
I see some of you already started typing stuff and stuff in, so I'm going to start scrolling back through. Uh, I will apologize for some guys that were having some audio problems. Hopefully, you'll be able to watch the recording. But let's get some uh, get some questions in, and we'll uh, answer some questions. I know there was a lot of material here for the topic. Okay, so looking back. Oops, didn't want to do that. I'll leave it there. And it looks like we have a question here. Okay, so this was an early question that Dan posed. He was saying, just curious, are there variables to control tool length and wear offsets? What would they look for during the webinar? Um, so, yeah, the same thing like I was, was physically going in and um, looking for the active length. Those are going to also be for the wear offset. Um, so start to dig into those system variable manual. That's where you're going to find these um, these variables specific to um, wear offsets. And yes, you can start writing your wear offset, reading the wear offset, just like I did with the length just before. Okay. Um, can you do a def anywhere in the program? or just at the top of the program? Great question, and I apologize that I hadn't pointed it out earlier because it would have goofed you guys up. So when you're defining variables, it has to be before any motion commands. Um, I always put them right at the very top. Had you neglected and moved them down, uh, um, potentially you're going to get an alarm or going to get an error. So just to kind of show you real quick, let's say we went back to one of the early programs. Uh, my integer. Here I have a, a def statement there, but what if I had put the def definition, actually let's get a better program to show you that in. Um, what would I want to do that in? Okay, so here, see how we're not, we're not going to use the variable to the very bottom of the program. So what had happened, would, would, would have happened had I cut all that and put that down maybe after my tool change. Again, it's still before the time I go to use the super command. Well, if you go to run it, it's going to give you an illegal statement. So the definition statements have to always exist prior to any motion commands right at the top of the program. Great question, Dan. Um, Peter, uh, is there an else if for more complicated branch? Yes. So if you, you probably put that before we got there, but um, if you look back and we go back to our PowerPoint, let me jump back. Um, if else, and if um, there, go into the manual because this was only an excerpt from this statement logic. But yes, you can do multi branch conditionals. Like here, this is showing you with an if conditional uh, or the else. Um, so there's a bunch of additional instructions. Check out that manual um, to get into more of those. Uh, Great. Is there a need to put values back into LEDs after defining them uh, in a sub? So again, you jump to the sub, and the LED doesn't exist anymore. So not only do you have to define it, but yes, you have to set it. Um, it's not going to maintain the value that was set in the main program. Um, so absolutely. So that's a perfect example of back to when we were playing around with the mains and the subs. Um, let's get back to where was it here. So we define this, and then we're going to want to use it later. Not only do I have to define it, I have to set it. Um, so if you saw before, I would have set those values. Okay. Um, great question. Let me read through. Just a, looks like just a couple more. I just want to make sure that there's nothing up here. All right, perfect. Um, oh, so here was a question that uh, was brought up. So is there any way to have an LED transfer to the subprogram? Um, so that actually gets into the PUD section. Um, so if I go back to the very top of this PowerPoint, I did glance over program global user variables. Now, program global and local global are really the same thing. This is looking for a machine data to be set. Um, if a machine data is set, it actually uses locals to be 
to be program. Um, so be careful with this. I, I, you know, I, I didn't bring it up originally or get into detail because it, it is machine data dependent. So you want to be careful uh, when using stuff that it has dependencies on machine data. Um, how many variables can I get? Um, so back to the R variable table, I'm sure they're probably referring to. Uh, the number's huge. I think it's 30,000. But again, be careful. If you do need to change it, a memory reorder is going to occur. So if you yourself go and change that value and you reboot the machine, it's going to lose its base setting. So it's going to come up. It's not going to know who it is, so to speak. And a, a, the backup of the system is going to have to be reloaded. So don't change any of those parameters unless you you know the process, especially in a memory or order. Had you type that value out, um, and just kind of to show you real quick, because it's important in case you do make this mistake. Uh, so if I go back, see 28050 is the variable. So if I come in, and I go to machine parameter, and let me just reset the alarm, 28050. Uh, oops, it's a channel, sorry. I see that my number of parameters is 100. So you come in and you say, oh, I'm going to change it to 200. Well, the minute you go to do the change on the machine, it's going to tell you that memory order has occurred. As long as you return the number back to the number you started from, you don't get caught in that little trap. So if you do play around in any parameters, make sure you write down whatever the value was before you change it. And if you get an alarm that says a memory reorder is about to be performed, stop. Put it back and then talk to somebody about the proper procedure for handling memory reorders. Okay. Uh, with that being said, um, I think we're in good shape. I think I handled all the questions. If I missed any, by all means, reach out to me. You guys have my contact information. I'm going to stop the recording now.